today and we have this amazing guest speaker here with us to enlighten us on the work of Knox Martin who is second generation abstract expressionist. He's 96 years old, probably one of two living of that New York school. Um, he studied with Robert Rauschenberg, he was great friends with um, de Kooning. He was great friends with Franz Klein. He's been written about by Clement Greenberg, one of the preeminent art historians of the century. Um, I asked Knox recently, I said, I know you have that essay by Clement Greenberg. Where is it? He said, oh, Nancy, I pissed him off a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right. he is um, quite the character. He is still very, very strong, very active, still painting. I've known him for for 30 years, I feel very blessed that I've known him and experienced Knox. Um, he is a mentor to so many people, you guys, so many great artists, um, dealers who have known him forever. He has shown with the best dealers in the country, for sure. Um, he has so much to add. He has um, influenced so many people's lives, and we're incredibly fortunate to have this incredible body of work here in Houston. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else really special about Knox. There are so many things. He is a shameless flirt. <laughs> 30 years ago when I met him, he was in his 60s. He said, Nancy, a face without freckles is like a night without stars. <laughs> and he had me right then, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, and I've just been infatuated with him ever since. But when you look at this work here today, it's a survey of work starting from the 60s. These are from the 60s. This is from the 70s, around the back wall, 70s in my office, um, more current work from the 2000s. Yep. So you can tell that he is very active in painting. And one of the things that thrilled me most about bringing this work to Houston is um, the artist's reactions. I mean, I have had artists crawling all over this space. They literally are going over every single piece with a fine tooth comb because Knox is a master. And just to be in his presence and to be able to study this work is so important. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Don, but I would like to introduce him. Our guest speaker, you guys, is Don Rain. He is a dear friend of Knox's and Knox was his mentor for over 30 years. So um, let me just read a little bit about Don. So he's, of course, a close friend, born in Houston, lived and worked in New York from 93 to 99. So of course, he is also an artist. Um, he's lectured on many various artists, specifically Knox Martin. He delivered a lecture on Knox's um, painting homage uh, to Dahim at the Art Students League in New York. He was invited by the president of the Art Students League and Knox Martin in 2015. He personally has a traveling exhibition, one man show, Don Ray Luminous Confrontations, uh, that was organized through the Arlington Museum of Art. So he is quite an accomplished artist in his own right and has exhibited Texas, New York, London all over the world. Um, so Knox has called him the Johnny Cash of American art because he was just so uh, lovely and um, I know Knox just adores you. And they had wonderful conversations in the last couple of weeks. So Knox knows that he's here. We're videoing it for him. So he feels like he's here and we'll send him all of the footage probably next week. Anyway. Um, enjoy your lunch, and then let's just be enlightened by Don. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You are so uh, I was going to start out my talk here <clears throat> with a story about how I met Knox. Uh, 
I can't remember the exact year it was, but uh, I was living and working in New York. I had a studio on 14th Street near 7th Avenue on the seventh floor of a seven-story building there. And um, it's now occupied entirely by the Pratt Institute. It's taken it over. But uh, I was in a studio that had been occupied by Philip Pavia, who is, uh, he was an old member of the New York school that organized that little club that they called the Eighth Street Club or the Cedar Tavern Club, you know, and he makes little uh, 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 things with uh, stones and, and some other uh, work. And so I had moved into that studio after he got out. And then they were doing a show across the hallway that included uh, Knox and uh, Philip Pavia and Esteban Vincenti and Fred Mitchell and several others whose names I don't recall now. But um, I was working in my studio with a friend of mine was there visiting me. All of a sudden, this sort of uh, sturdy, stout built older man walks into my studio, just kind of strolls in, looking around. And, and his eyes get real big, and he's making little sounds like, mm, mm. and, and uh, then he, he starts to talk. And <clears throat> he starts telling me what my art is about. When I, at first I thought, who is it? I've never seen this. Who is this man? Come in here and tell me what my work is about. But in about three or four minutes, I began to realize I was in the presence of someone that knew more about art than anyone I had ever experienced in my entire life or who was ever likely to experience in the future. When he left, it was as if a great wave had passed over me. You know, I was still dripping from it. I had to go in the bathroom, look at myself in the mirror and say, you are an ignorant man, <laughs> but you're not gonna stay ignorant. You're gonna get up there and you're gonna learn from him. And so I got to his studio and of course, one of the, the first things I saw was this, crow with no mouth. <laughs> it was still, not even on a stretcher. It was hanging on a wire, you know, with some other things. And um, he was good enough to invite me to his lectures at the Art Students League. Those things were in progress at that time, and then they were being filmed. And uh, so I was very, very fortunate to be able to get up there to, uh, to those lectures. And then from then on, uh, he became my mentor and my friend. And uh, I, I can't put it into words how I feel about it. He was almost like a, a second father to me. But um, in, in talking about the work, I, there's a piece here that was, that was in this show that's not here today. Uh, and some of you, I think, if you could hand those things out, please. Uh, this piece is important because uh, it's an important part of what I wanted to talk about today. This is called Crow with No Mouth. And... Um, it's a piece, a uh, somewhat later piece. It was, I think I first saw it in uh, 96. Knox had been working on it for a couple of years, and, or a year or so, and uh, then he, he, it was in some kind of a show and he took it back and worked on it some more. I'm gonna tell you some story about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he actually put it out for me when I came back to New York after I moved back to Texas just for me, because he knew I was coming, he knew how much I loved it, and he put it out, and so I was able to run my hands all over it. And uh, so I've, I've been knowing this painting for a long time now. I think the official date of completion is 2006 on it, but um, I've known it a lot longer than that. And uh, you throw your eye over here a little bit, and I'm just going to talk about, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna postpone talking about it a little bit because there's a couple of general things I need to say first. Always get ahead of myself. Uh, I don't know why I make these notes. I never follow them. Um, the first thing you need to understand about Knox, his work is figurative. It's figurative, it's metaphorical, and it's poetic. Knox rejects uh, the uh, abstract label. Uh, he, he's, he's certainly part of the New York school, and there's no doubt about that in, in terms of he came up during that time, during that time period. And so there's no doubt about that, but you should always regard him as being figurative. He's very insistent about that. Also, another thing is he should never be put into any group or movement or pigeonholed or something like that. Knox is to be seen on a, on a steady time continuum. He, he, this, I'm going to quote him now. He says, the real cutting edge of art comes from a specific lineage. What he means by that is 
It comes all the way down from people like Titian and Velasquez and Delacroix and Cezanne and Matisse and so forth. And it's carried forward by people that come in history, one after the other. That's the real cutting edge. It's not something that just grew like Topsy out here in the field. It, it, Knox has taken things that came before him and used them and forged them into something that's all his own. He's created it from, from what came before him. And he'll tell you this. He, he's, he's beholden to these people. He's an heir. He's to be seen as an heir of those who've come before him and a legator of those that will come after him. Uh, so that's just a, a general statement about his art. Uh, with regards to this particular painting, uh, I'm talking about crow with no mouth here. The first thing you see on it is that black and white. Uh, the crow and the, the white surrounding it here. Uh, this is a single crow, by the way. He's got it broken up here, but it's a single crow. You'll notice he's put the eyes on it. If you see it, if you look at it carefully, you'll see the Picasso-like eyes up here on its head. You know, he's <laughs> spaced the eyes. And, uh, but it's, it's the black and the white that really stand out and come at you the first thing you see. Uh, it's very important to Knox. I'm going to talk about that aspect of his work a little bit later on. Then you notice this crescent moon. Now, this is collaged on, this crescent moon. It, it was made from something else and, and collaged onto the surface. Um, the, uh, the color that's there underneath the crescent moon is weather. That's a thunderstorm coming in. What we have here is a crow that's raiding an outdoor table is what we've got here. And we've got fruit and, and vegetables and things like that on the table for our salad. And so that's what's going on. But, and, and this is a, a weather front coming in here, this, this purple and, and black. Uh, something that really threw me here about this painting, and I, I told Nancy before we started, just completely knocked me off. I didn't get it at all. He had to tell me this. This red is a whale, a, like an ocean-going whale. It's got its mouth open, you see here, and its tail whipping back like this, you see. And, uh, and, and that's, that's why I figured out that the reason why you have these oranges sort of floating in midair, it's like something that's going to be consumed by the whale is coming at it with its mouth open. The whale is a symbol for Knox. It's a, it's a metaphor relating to peace. Uh, and he uses it from time to time. And I think this is the closest that I can ever say that Knox came into a, a sort of a surreal type thing, but that's kind of what this is with the whale. Uh, I didn't figure it out. He had to tell me that. Um, the, um, the ta you can see the edge of the table down at the bottom of it, but the table can be read more than one way. Uh, and Knox likes to do this. You can read the table as sort of slanting into the picture, and you can see the tablecloth falling off on the right, uh, uh, lower right corner, and uh, you, you can see the, the, the feet of the table, like a pedestal table, coming out here in the lower left-hand corner. That's the feet of the table on sort of reddish tile here, and you see these, this reddish tile crop out a little bit over here on the other side, you see. And so, that's, that's your framework here. The, the yellow fruit are grapes, and the big black appendage there is the stem. Now, Knox has, has done that before when he's painted grapes. He always paints the stem large like this and black. And so, I've seen this before in his work. But one of the most important things about this painting is, now this is my, my terminology here, it's a sort of a weaving technique that he uses, uh, over and under thing. Uh, Nikola Tesla, I once used this quote with, uh, on a, speaking on a Knox Martin painting, said that uh, to understand the universe, you need to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Knox, well, the energy of course is obvious, but the vibration is not so obvious. It's more subtle. You, you, you feel it more than you see it. And you can walk up and look at his work closely, and then you can see sort of how he's doing it. But if you look at this painting carefully, and even you could probably see it in this reproduction, and I'm showing you some of these others, you have one color overlapping another color, and then that same color that was overlapped overlaps the overlapping color. Uh, uh, right, right here, in the, you see the sky color overlapping the table, you see? 
And, uh, and th this is, Knox does this all the time. And uh, another thing that I want to show you here is uh, the fact this blue line in this plate, this is sort of a plate here, right here. There's a blue line there. Now, if you just look at this thing, just glance at it, it looks like the blue line is behind the oranges and comes around behind the stem of the grapes and behind the, the, the crow, but it doesn't. That blue line impales these oranges here, if you look at it carefully, and it comes around and it doesn't join together. It's disjointed, the way Cezanne used to do with tables, you know, they'd be disjointed, the edge of a table. But also notice that the blue line comes over the grape stem and it also comes over the crow right here, you see. You have to look at this, and, and when you see that, then you begin to understand why it makes you feel the way it does, you see. Another really big aspect of this painting, and perhaps one of the biggest, is the use of white. Uh, it's hard to overemphasize how important white is to Knox. It's critical. In this case, it's this painting is laced with it. Just literally, it's like a lattice work. It's, it's uh, these uh, 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 the salad are down here in the screen, it's just laced with white. White encases the, the, the oranges. Uh, it's all over the whale. It's, it's over, over the crow. And, and what it does, scattered around like that, he brings the painting together. He forces you to see it as a unified whole, you see. And I guess really maybe the, the final analysis here of just looking at this painting that white may be the most important aspects of it, you know. Uh, but um, I want to also, before I get off of that subject, there's two little pieces in the office in here, black and white. He uses that weaving technique there extensively. If you go in there and look at those pieces, and I invite you to do so before you leave, you'll see that in some places the black overlaps the white, and other places the white overlaps the black. This is very important to Knox. It, it creates that vibration, you see. And you're, you know you're seeing something, you're feeling something from it, but you don't know what it is until you really get up there and study it, and then you understand why you're feeling the way you do about it. Also, the color is paramount in there because there's so little, uh, there's such a little amount of it, you see? So it just, boom, stands right out at you. Those black and white pictures are very important to Knox, and I think they're a very important part of his obra. I will also say this picture here is near the top of his obra. It, this, this is a great masterpiece, and there's no doubt about it. Um, I wanted to talk about some of these paintings over here. Um, I'm... I'm, I'm the ones I'm going to talk about right now are the, are the two on the right and the one over here on this other wall. Um, these paintings, uh, you know, you could change the colors in them some and they'd be okay. They'd be all right. Uh, but the black and white must be. Absolutely must be. It's critical. It, you, you, if you ch change the black and white to colors, It'd it sink it. Uh, and uh, Knox, the only thing that Knox would tell me about these paintings, he said they are, they are uh, metaphysical, relating to time and space. I see them as not only poetic, but musical. And let me see if I can explain that. Um, Knox uses white sort of the way a composer uses a rest. In music, you know, he, he, he divides things up with the rest. He, he creates notes, a duration of the notes, volume, some loud, some soft. He, he has um, the concept of chords, chordal structure here. Like, you know, C, E, and G make the uh, chord C major, okay? Well, he'll have these notes together that come together that form a section. And, and he'll tweak it a little bit here and there. He'll, he'll flat the third and make it a minor. Or he'll, he'll sharp the fifth and make it an augmented chord, you see. It, just just, just little, little tweaks. I want you to notice, too, I hope when I get through talking here, you'll go around and look at these paintings very carefully, because you really should. Knox does little things. Look at this one on the far right, for instance. See, he splatters tiny little pieces of, of paint. See down there in that black at the bottom part of it with the white? 
that's splattered on there. If, if you go up there and study this thing, you'll see that he's done that. In a lot of these paintings, he's done this. A lot of them. And that's that little tweak that he gives it. Uh, and, and it, it, when you see it from a distance, you don't really realize it. But you know there's something there. You're, you're feeling it, but you have to get up there and look at it before you can actually see that. Um, uh, also, uh, and, and this is true of all these paintings in here, um, they look from a distance to be very sharp lines, but they're not. They're not. Some of them get pretty ragged, you know, he, it, it, and it's for a reason. You know, it's, it's that vibration aspect of it. This one here in the middle, boy, that black is absolutely essential. That, that is so important, I can't overemphasize it. This always reminds me of an aerial landscape. Uh, look, he's got, it's like the top is the sky and the bottom is like uh, uh, one of those photographs you see of tulip fields in, in the Netherlands, you know? Uh, but but he's, he, the sky, he's, he's, he's got it like this, you see? And he does it, look here, he does it by simply making this corner here and this one here. And, and, and by doing just this and this, he tilts it like that, you see? And then, because he's made this line curved, see it rolls up here like that, you know? And you get this sense of some... Knox, Knox always likes to say he paints flat, but you get this sense of depth to it. Uh, again, look, if you get up to here close, I invite you after I get through talking, see a little, little green patch right here, just a tiny little tweak right there. And see, boom, 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 little patches. You can't see them from a distance, but they're there, you know, and it makes, it makes a, a difference even from a distance, but you don't realize it until you look at it closely. Uh, and and uh, you, you've got the same thing over here with this one, see? You've got, look here, you've got this little red, red uh, dribble here and the black one here, you see? Boom, boom. And, and this red is picked up here with this with this shape right here. It, it's a sort of a musical thing, these pictures are. That's the way I've always seen them. Um, the, uh, the big diptych is closely related to this other picture over here. And it's also closely related to another picture I have to tell you a story about. Um, I wouldn't have believed this story if Knox hadn't told me himself. But before I started on the story, I'm going to say a little bit about this picture here. You've got these overlapping planes. Yes, it's flat, but he creates depth by overlapping the planes, you see. And um, he's got this very dark color up here in the upper left-hand corner. And look, he splattered, he splattered some of that dark color down. And he's got, he's got this, this, this color over here is actually indented into, it's sort of dug into the surface, you see. But it's almost, these over here, the splatters over here are almost as if someone had laid glass or plastic over it and splattered that because they're just floating on the surface. Whereas this one here is pushed back into it. Also notice that these, these images are not sharp at all. And they're kind of freehand painted, you know. You see, they're not so geometric after all. Actually, they're, they're, they're more biological in a way than they are geometric. And the, the lines are jagged. That's a very important part of this painting. See, look here at how, how jagged these lines are here, these, these black lines against the white. It's, it's part of his way of setting up that, that vibration. The, the story I was going to tell you, Knox did a painting very similar to this diptych called The Mulberry Hill. And it was in a show in uh, New York, oh, it's years and years ago. And uh, Knox went down to the show after it was hung and he told the gallery owner, he said, this is not finished. I'm not finished with this painting. And the gallery owner said, oh, Knox, please, come on. He said, no, I said, I, I, I've got to take it back. And no, so they argued back and forth about it. And finally, the gallery owner pre prevailed upon Knox to let him, let him go ahead and keep it in the show. And then he could take it home and work on it, OK? Right. Well, Knox told him, don't sell this painting. You can sell anything else, don't sell this one. Well, you know what the first one he sold. Yeah. And who did he sell it to? The Whitney Museum of American Art. <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, undaunted, 
our hero is not going to let that go. <laughs> no, sir, not Knox Martin that we all know and love. He dons this heavy overcoat with pockets on the inside with brushes and pre-mixed paint. Yes. And he has a couple of friends with him, and he goes down to the museum. The friends are there to distract the guards, see? <laughs> he goes down there to the museum, and his friends distract the guard. He's over there working on it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, of course, that doesn't, you know, the guards catches him. You know, you can see this coming. And uh, you can imagine the pandemonium. The alarm is raised, and guards are running everywhere, and someone's defacing the painting, and Knox is backing up and says, I'm the artist, I'm the artist, you know, as if that made any difference. And uh, finally, the director, I don't know whether it was David Ross or who it was at the time, Knox didn't remember himself, but the director steps off the elevator and he sees Knox and of course he recognizes him. He says, he said, Knox, come, come with me. Come with me. <laughs> and he takes him down to his office and he says, please, Knox, please. So I don't want to call the police here. Promise me you're not going to do something like this again, please. And Knox said, it's okay now, it's finished, you know. <laughs> And, 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 you know, in this regard, Knox always reminds me of a, of a character from a William Faulkner novel called The Reavers named Boone Hagenbeck. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that or not, but it says that he counts no cost, knows no bounds, and fears no retribution. That's Knox. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the type of person you're dealing with here. Uh, on the, this, this big, wonderful thing here, this one. Uh, it's called the Garden. There's a little bit of confusion here. The one over here on this wall is called the Garden of Time, and so is this one. Uh, as you can see, they're quite a bit different. Um, I had to get something confirmed on this painting myself. It was my belief that the green and the lower part of it with the little color circles was the actual garden. Knox confirmed that's true. That is the garden. In other words, of the whole big, this painting is called the Garden of Time. The garden is this little green area down here. Okay? Now, so what is the rest of it? It's like sky and sunshine, air, clouds. We've got that vibration in spades now. If you come up here and look at it, you'll see that in places, the blue overlaps the white, the white overlaps the blue, the yellow overlaps the blue, the yellow overlaps the pink, and, and it's the over and under is all through it. And he's, he's put other colors down and painted over them. And the, the result of it is, the result of it is, is that it's, it's visceral. It's something that's more, it's, it's made to be more felt than seen, and certainly more seen than talked about, which sort of takes everything away. There's not a whole lot I can say about it. To, to the honest truth, there's just not a whole lot I can say about it, and Knox has never told me very much about it. He wasn't willing to talk very much about this painting, but um, I will say the yellow, the blue, and the pink are that combination is one of his favorite color combinations. And usually when he does that, in every painting I can think of that I've seen where he's used that color combination, and the, and the blue is cobalt usually, um, it has, has a joyous aspect to it. You, you almost, it's almost like uh, that old Indian chief said, you, it makes your heart soar like an eagle. And uh, I have to say, I told Nancy earlier, uh, her placement of it here was as good as it could be done in this gallery. It, 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 you walk in the door over there and you've got this tremendous field of vision. And, and then you can get right up close to it. And if you're going to be photographed, you, have, you need to be photographed with it because it, the scale is one of the most important things about this picture. It needs to be that big. If you photograph it and show it, and you know, you, it's on artsy. You know, I've seen it. You, along with these other pictures? No. No, no. You, you can't, you just can't get your head around it until you actually see how big it is. Because that is a huge big part of it. I, I cannot overemphasize the aspect of the scale on this one. Um, which brings to mind another story. This one I found out just recently now. Uh, Knox is even online telling the story. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it with my memory here, but um, he 
uh, a big painting of his was sold through some gallery. I want to say it was Fishback, but I'm not sure. At any rate, it's been years ago, and it was sold to this lady. And I don't know if it was this big or not, but it was a big painting. And uh, she ran into Knox at a function or something later, and she told him, Knox, you're going to have to take that painting back. It's just killing everything else in the room. It's just, just, just killing it. I, I need to get something milder from you. Milder. Well, Knox says, I don't know if I have anything milder. What's that mean? And he said, I'll tell you what, let me think about it, and we'll get back together, and we'll talk about it. And so nothing happened for a while. A couple of months later, he runs into her again. And she says, Knox, I've decided to keep that painting. I got rid of everything else in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's the solution. <laughs> Here's your solution right there is get rid of the other stuff, you know. <laughs> and so this is what I think of when I see this big painting, I think of that. You know, it, it is a very domineering thing. And you notice the way Nancy has it hung, see, there's nothing around it but white. You see, and, uh, and that really picks up the white that's in it and shows it off to the maximum extent, I think. But after I finish my talk, I urge you to go up here and just, just take a close look at this thing. You'll see that, that the yellow is overlapping this white and the blue, but you'll see the, the white and the blue overlapping each other. Uh, and go up here and study it very carefully. Take the time to look at it. Now, um, the pictures around the corner, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about them too much because they're sort of out of sight here, but I will say those are very poetic pictures, and they have to do with the woman's face. And uh, if you look at those pictures, you'll see that, that Knox is using um, a sort of rhyme. He'll put in shapes that rhyme. This shape rhymes with another shape and rhymes with another shape like poetry. And this is, those are really uh, some of the most poetic pieces in the show. And I urge you to go back there and look at them. Uh, the one on, as you're standing there looking at them, the one on the right, I think, is the more powerful of the two, in my view, because, because of his use of white. Uh, it's, <laughs> I just can't possibly overemphasize how important white is to Knox. And so I urge you to go around there and look at those, uh, you know, after the talk is over. Um, I'm trying to, I sort of got wound up here, so I'm trying to collect my, uh, my <laughs> thing. Um, I want to, before I, I close up here, I want to give you another Knox Martin quote that I've heard him say many times. I can make it, and I can point to it. What does he mean by that? Well, I'll tell you, those lectures... You know, uh, some critic or, or writer said that he, he called Knox a lightning rod of empowerment. <laughs> that was a good term. Uh, I've called him a light-bearing prophet, opening doors that you didn't even know were there, you know. <laughs> and so <laughs> these lectures that he's done, he talks about all sorts of art, even oriental art. Uh, old art, new art, and uh, I remember what he would do is he'd have uh, a, um, a slide projector, and they, they would flash a, a picture up on the screen, and he'd use a laser pointer and point out things. Because when Knox is lecturing, he goes in big circles a lot of times, and sometimes, like when I first went to a lecture, he said, what on earth is he talking about? I, I, I don't get it. He's rambling. That's what you think. You think he's, he's not rambling. He just goes in big circles when he talks, you know, big, big circles. And so you have to hold on, and he'll come, he'll, he'll make the point, you know. But, but when he sat down, he started using that laser pointer. And I remember the, the piece, the first piece that I went to see was Night Fishing at Antibes by Picasso, which belongs to MoMA. I've seen it several times before I went to Knox's lecture. Thought I had. I hadn't. I hadn't seen it. Saw it for the first time through him. He would say, look how this balances this. See how this rhymes with that? You see what this is here? There were a whole bunch of things in that picture I didn't get. And so, you know, he brought me along, like from, from, from where I was then to where I am now, I mean, he brought me along, you see. He opened the doors for me. And he'll open the door for you too. Um, those lectures, 
I don't know what the deal is on them right now. Like I said, they were all filmed and recorded. Uh, I got a hold of one to show at the Arlington Museum of Art. It's a big success. Um, the last time I looked, and it's been years ago, those things were, I think you could buy them from Knox's website, but I'm not sure about that anymore. Nancy, if you're interested in that, Nancy will probably be able to help you with it. Because I'm gonna tell you something, if all you've seen is Knox's art, you've missed almost half of him because the rest of him is his knowledge about art. And, the, and those lectures bring that out. And there's, they're worthwhile for you to spend some time looking at them. And um, you'll learn from them. They're very important. There's a couple of things I'd like for you to take away from the talk. Um, and I'm, I have to circle all the way back to the beginning. If you forget everything else I said then, I go back to the very beginning and say that Knox is to be regarded as figurative, metaphorical, and poetic. You must always regard his work that way. Poetry is very important to him. And, and he's to be seen as, like as part of a chain all the way back from Titian and coming right on down to him and then going even on beyond him. You know, he, he's, he's, already, he's already been passing the baton off. It's not like he's just been, you, we're not, you know, he's going to die and then someone's going to get, no, he's already been doing it. He's been doing it for a long time now, you see. And these artists that came to see this show that Nancy was talking about, he's doing it to them, you see. It's a, it's a continuum. And that's the real cutting edge of art. It's not somebody that comes up with something, uh, goes out here and picks up something off the ground and says, hey, hey, this is my art, I'll sign it for you. Uh, you might have seen that little cartoon, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, where they come outside in a beautiful snow landscape, and Calvin says, boy, this is great. This is my art. He picks up a twig and signs it. You know? And then Hobbes says, you know, the trick is, is to know in the art world, to know who's putting on who, you know. But uh, Knox, Knox is insistent about the cutting edge of art coming from this specific lineage. And hopefully you'll take these things away with you from my talk. And uh, I, I, at that point I'll conclude uh, subject to if anyone wants to ask any questions, which I will attempt to answer. So. Uh, Does anyone have any questions? I'll be more than happy to attempt to answer them. What year was the, the Whitney escapade? Pardon? What year that happened? With the Whitney, you know, the painting is at the same date approximately as, as your big diptych here. I think that's a 60s piece. And, uh, and I believe that event occurred not long after that. You can, listen, you can pull the Mulberry Hill up online and answer your question. And you can, if, you, if you Google uh, Knox Martin, Whitney Museum of Art, it'll bring Mulberry Hill up. I've, I've done this, and uh, you can see how similar it is to this diptych. You know, if, if, you, if you were the owner of this diptych, you got something very similar to what the Whitney Museum has on Knox Martin, you know, very similar. And so, um, and, and I, would, I would urge you to do that, to go ahead and pull it up and take a look at it, you know? So it's really interesting. Um, do we have any other, yes, yes ma'am. Pardon, I'm not hearing he is 96. you. He is 96 years old. He'll be 97 in February. Is he actually still painting? Yes, ma'am. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I went to see him. Uh, of course, I got, I've been back since. I've been back a number of times. This was right before I got invited to the league to speak on him. I came to see him, and he pulled this thing out, this homage to the Hame. And that studio of his, not that big, it's his big, big painting, and it just overpowered. It was just like it filled up the whole room. And I started talking about it. And you know, this one, he said, I, want, I want you to come to the league and, and talk about it, you know? And so then he and Ira Goldberg got together and cooked up that deal, you know? But he was 90 years old when he painted that. And, and in my view, it may be, it just very well may be the best thing he's ever done. And it's the greatest painting of the 21st century, as far as I'm concerned. And he was 90 years old when he did it. I'm sorry, you had a question? Oh, I wondered if you could comment on the 
Um, you said poetry was very important to him, and I was interested in the comparisons between the rhyming. And um, did does he have favorite poets that you're aware of? You know, it, it's it's strange, but I, I, Knox has written poetry himself too. You know. Yes, uh, the mermaid poems, for instance. Um, I remember specifically the, the musical composers that he loved so much, um, and I'm going to make a little comment about that in just a minute. Uh, Beethoven and Mozart, gosh, he loves them. And the ones he hates, Wagner, don't ever mention Wagner in Knox's presence. Don't ever do that if you want to get, don't ever mention two people, Richard Wagner and Caravaggio. Don't talk about those people in Knox's presence. I kid him. He'll take it from me. I kid him about Caravaggio. And he'll take it from me, but he may not take it from you. And, and you know, but. Uh, Pardon? What's the problem with Caravaggio? He, uh, the molding, the heavy molding. He, uh, Knox adopts, he likes to quote Nicholas Poussin saying, uh, Caravaggio was a man born to destroy art. And uh, that's the way Knox feels about Caravaggio. Uh, I, I'll, go, I'll go even further than that and tell you that Knox doesn't think a whole lot of the Florentine Renaissance in general either. Uh, he considers Michelangelo to be an engineer. Uh, he, he, he puts his emphasis on the Venetians, Titian. Veronese, Tintoretto, that bunch, you know. That's where he puts his, uh, his uh, uh, emphasis. Uh, you said something there, and, and you, you remind me something, and I'm, it's gone right out of my mind. When, when you, poetry. What, what was that? Oh, poetry. Poetry, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I don't recall any specific poets. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I want, this is what I was going to say, though, what you reminded me of. There, and I told Nancy about this. There's a film that it's going to come out pretty soon, a documentary. It's called 32 at 32. You might keep an eye out for it. It's very interesting for you folks because it's about a young concert pianist, Adam Golka, who was born and raised in Katy, Texas, same place where my parents lived when I was born. And... This young man is he's going to turn 32, and he's exploring the 32 sonatas of Beethoven. Okay, now he's he's played all over the world. He's he won the Shanghai competition when he was 17 years old. I heard him play the first time when he was 15. When his mother brought him to TCU when he was 15 years old to to get a degree when he was 15, and he studied with with my friend Jose Fagali, who won the gold medal at, at the Van Clabern in 1985. And then he went on to study with Leon Fleischer at uh, the Peabody uh, Conservatory in Baltimore, uh, Johns Hopkins University. But at any rate, Adam wanted to bring in uh, people from other walks of art, from other disciplines. And he, he called me, because I had introduced him to Knox some years before. He lives close to Knox in New York. And uh, he said, Donna, I'd like to have Knox as the visual artist in my film. And so I, I kind of, you know, put things together there. And he went up and, and, and I've seen a, a clip of it, a film clip of it, where he's in Knox's studio. He brought an electric keyboard with him because Knox doesn't have a piano in his studio. And he's playing this Beethoven and the look on Knox's face says everything. He doesn't even have to talk. I mean, you can just look at his face and, and see that it's just, it's just like reaching for the sublime. But uh, I think that, that you should watch for this film coming out. I, my understanding is it's going to come out early next year. 32 at, at, at like, you know, at with your uh, email address, 32 at 32 is the name of it. And the young man's name is Adam Golka, G-O-L-K-A. Uh, he, he's kind of a pretty well known in musical circles here in Houston, I think. Uh, he plays, he plays here quite frequently. Uh, I've heard him play with the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra a number of times. And he's played with symphony orchestras all over the world. You know, he's, he's been everywhere. Do we have any other questions? Oh, question. Yes, ma'am. What is the date where we're sitting? What is the date range of the work? Well, I, I tell you what, there, there's, there's some dates on this little document right here. But, but um, the, uh, you got... Uh, the diptych in, in this piece over here on the left it, are 60s, I think, and and also the, uh, the these are 60s. Uh, 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 these three are 60s. This one's 70s. The one around the one the two around the corner are 70s. So now it's also. Can you comment? I mean, this is really sort of interesting. You know, now we have the term millennial pink. I mean, this is 
kind of a big deal for a, you know, a, a male painter to be taking this pink and these they, they feel so now. I mean, if you said they were done, you know, past four years, this would not be surprising. You're making a very, a very good point. Uh, Knox is one of those rare individuals, and I say rare because uh, so many artists, they hit a certain plateau and that's it, you know. They, they, that's it. I mean, they, they, everything else after that is sort of a pastiche of what they did before. Knox is never flagged. On and on he goes, like, like Cezanne did, like Matisse did. He keep like Matisse coming up with those cutouts at the end of his life. I mean, it was incredible. That's Knox. Uh, he just keeps right on going. And, and here he is, you know, at 96, still working. And at 90 did what I regard to be perhaps at least what I've seen, the greatest painting of his career, uh, Homage to the Hame. I don't know, I can't even say enough about that painting. You, you need to see that one to believe it. So I have, a, I have a, one question. Okay. Just because I've spent some time with Knox, and you can elaborate on this. Mm -hmm. So Knox used to spend every Sunday at the cafe at the Met holding court for years and years and years. Okay, that was... He, he, I don't know, he may have done it Sundays before, but when I knew him, it was Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. night. Okay. Uh, and I was there for many of those. Right. It was the thing to do. Uh, yes, it yes, it was. I'll tell you a couple of stories on that, because <laughs> we, uh, I had this friend, and I won't mention his name, because he'd be embarrassed, but uh, a very vociferous, uh, outspoken person, and Knox knows him real well, too. And Knox sort of tolerates him, and uh, we were there, and there was a number of people sitting around this table at the, at the, at the bar in the Metropolitan Museum in, in New York. And uh, we were sitting there, and somehow another Franz Klein's name came up. And so, you know, Franz Klein was to Knox what Knox is to be, you see. He was kind of a mentor of Knox, helped Knox. Um, so this person starts launched into Klein, talking about how his work wasn't worth a flip, and he couldn't see how anybody could find anything in Franz Klein's work. And, and Knox, you know, with that gentle voice of his, you've heard it. Well, well now, now you have to understand that this, this and that and whatnot. He was being very, very gentle with this person and um, very easy with him. And I was kicking him under the table, trying to get him to shut up, you know? And, uh, because I knew what to deal with. And so someone distracted me for a moment. I don't, I don't, asked me a question or something off on my right, and he was sitting on my left. The next thing I knew, I turned around and Knox had doubled up his fist and said, one more word out of you and I'm going to put you on the floor. You know? <laughs> and, and I want to tell you, in, in that regard, uh, Knox, you know, studied boxing when he was young, and I think he was Mr. America in 1948, but his arms are as big as my legs. And, and, and even when he was in his 70s, he, you know, he was not a man to be crossed, let me tell you. Uh, one, one night I was there after my daughter was born, and, and my daughter has come all the way up with him from the time she was newborn, and she's now a junior at NYU. And uh, we brought her up there in the little pram deal, and uh, Natasha, uh, my wife, had forgotten the Pampers, you see. And here we are at the museum, and she's just soaking wet, just... Oh, it's awful. And so Knox goes over there. It's just, it's just grace, you know. He goes over there and gets one of those, nap, those cloth napkins they have there. They're about the size of a flag. You know, they're about this big, about this big. Here he comes back with this cloth napkin. It worked like thunder. She went back there and changed it, and my daughter was wearing that cloth napkin. I don't know what ever happened to it, but uh, we're, we're till, still telling stories about it. And, and she goes to visit him from time to time. And we have a lot of photos of them together. Uh, you know, we went to his studio when she was about, I guess, six years old, and she was over there wanting to feed his, his African gray parrot called Boo, B-U, that's his name, Boo. And, um, and Knox kept telling her, Rusie, that parrot will bite you. If you're a stranger, he'll bite you. Rusie was undeterred. She's kind of like Knox herself, you know. No, she's going to feed that parrot, you know. And I was concerned about it. Knox said, he's going to bite. Never did bite her. Parrot, she and that parrot got along just fine. Knox was even amazed at that himself. Uh, there, there's so many stories I could tell you about Knox. Uh, I, I, you know, I have to stop. I'll, I'm, I'm one more. I'll just, just one more. Uh, <laughs> uh, dealer came by one time. He said, "You're getting ready to go to to see Knox." He said, "Oh, I just I hate to go up there. Oh, 
So, you know, his, he said, I was up there one time and a rabbit came hopping through the room. I said, Knox, where'd that rabbit come from? And Knox said, what rabbit? And I said, just shut up, you know, don't say <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, the, the, the thing that was, that was funny about it, and this kind of spills over onto me a little bit, is that uh, uh, there was this, this class, that, that place where that show was with Knox and Esteban Vicente, but it had been taken over by uh, this, this Russian guy or Ukrainian guy that was running a little class to teach people classics and painting, you know, like, uh, like this glass or, you know, he had nude models sometimes, things like this. So one of these nude models he had, she was one of these little little uh, gals, kind of how Frenchy looking. She was actually Cuban, I think. She had blonde hair, and you know, wear a tam on the side of her head, and you know, her skirt was just barely enough to cover her rear end, you know, and boots up to here, and and she had that walk, you know, and, and had that look like she knows something you don't know, you know, <laughs> and uh, she she had come in over there, and I, I played the piano one day or something, and and uh, Chopin, I'm I'm no pianist, let me assure you. But uh, at any rate, it was, they said it was like catnip for her, and she, she came over during a break to, to, to talk, see? And she developed a habit of doing it. And so um, that day, uh, uh, the, the, this dealer had gone on to see Knox, and, um, and my wife had come in, see? Or she got off early, she was working somewhere, and she got off and she was sitting there, and here comes this little model in, see? Here she comes, in her little kimono thing, you know? And uh, talks to me for a while, and then, then, then leaves. And my wife didn't say anything at the time. When we got down on the street, she said, Don, I said, how often does that woman come to your studio? And I said, what woman? <laughs> <laughs> what rabbit? You know, I don't, I don't. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, if, if anyone has any other questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. But uh, I, think, I think I better stop telling stories here. <laughs> what a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I was glad to do it. What a rare opportunity. Yeah, well, and it was insight into history. It was really? a great opportunity for me to come and talk about my good friend and in what I regard to be the greatest artist alive. I challenge you to say, uh, any, to name anybody else. I can't think of a single one, you know. So, and it's been my pleasure and my honor to have known him. Let me assure you of that.